All right, uh, this is a video that is intended for specific people who write me and refer to Strong's uh, word meanings in their concordance. And uh, I want to try to explain to you what Strong's concordance is, and it cannot be used as a dictionary. And so if you tell me Strong's translates, for example, the word pistoo as meaning believe, for example, but it doesn't use the word obey, there's a reason for that because the King James didn't know that was the meaning of the word obey, or they chose not to use that meaning. But a concordance tied to the King James is only going to give you the meanings that were used in the King James Bible, not the meanings that actually are in truth, the all the meanings. So if you look at a King James, uh, look at the Strong's concordance for the word pistoo in Greek, you're only going to see how it was translated that way in the King James Bible. You are not getting a true dictionary. So you are, you are misleading yourself. And then other people use Strong's as some sort of way of assembling a translation. So it's, it's, and, and so as a result, you, you, it's garbage in, garbage out. It can never lead to a proper translation because you don't have all the word meanings. So I'm going to show you uh, uh, some scholarly commentary first, and then I'm going to show you what you need to replace it with instead. It's free. It's online. It's Strong's excuse me, it's called Mouncey's Greek Dictionary. It can be found at Bible Gateway. That's one access point, and the other is to go bill, to billmouncey.com, okay? So just stick with me for a few minutes. I think I can explain this adequately enough, and we'll get there right now. Okay, and uh, in the description that goes along with this article, you'll have a link to this detailed article with hyperlinks where you can follow up on what I'm saying here, and you can verify everything. So uh, this is at our webpage. And uh, so let's look at it. It's titled, Strong's Concordance is Not to be Used as a Dictionary. So if you want to find out the meaning of a word, Strong's is not the way. You're, you're not using it the way it was intended. Or I should say, the way it was could only have been done by a person who was not a Greek linguist at all, didn't know Greek uh, words at all very well. So he didn't attempt to do any dictionary. He attempted to do what's called concordance, which is a, a if you study the word concordance, it doesn't mean dictionary. It means, how is this same Greek word translated by the King James translators in every other place it appears in, in the New Testament? So that's a King James concordance. Now, some concordances will come out for a different form of the Bible. But all you're doing is you're looking up how that same Greek word is translated in other passages. But it doesn't tell you what the range of meanings are for the passage you're looking at. So let's say you're trying to find a new meaning. It won't be there. So let's, let, let's go here. A Greek word concordance for the KJV will not help one know for certain a Greek word's meaning because a concordance does not claim to be a dictionary. So that's the fundamental point. Instead, it represents a list of what English word was used to translate a Greek word in the source Bible. King James is the source Bible. NIV is the source Bible. I think uh, there used to be concordances for the NSRV. All these things are, are now defunct. The concordance system of looking up things is defunct. You need to stop it. <laughs> it's just, it's wasting your time. You have such a much better resource, and I'll show you the difference in a little bit. For example, a KJV concordance like Strong's, so con my recollection, Strong's only was always tied to the KJV, okay? So I don't think they've ever come out with an edition connected to a different version of the Bible. Okay. It's not a dictionary. Instead, Strong's is a listing of how in 1611, each Greek word or its root form was translated into English by the King James Version of the Bible. So let me just say this. If there was some scholarship that has improved since 1611, and now we know the word at issue has many more meanings than we knew back in 1611, you won't know anything about it because you're using a concordance, which doesn't give us any updated dictionary definitions. And just so you know, you could even have a change in meaning in the words in English, and now we need to use a new English word because English is changing. Since, since 1611, a lot of our words, actually, some of our words mean the opposite of what they used to mean. So you have to change the word in your concordance to, to no longer be strictly whatever the King James uses a translation. Okay, now here's what's key to know, and it'll remind you, you why you can't do this. And why was Strong so limited? because he was limited uh, academically. Strong's himself was not even a linguist in Greek. That means he didn't study the, it as a language. But it was not a necessary skill. All he was doing was providing an index between the KGB's choice 
and the Greek root word reflected by the actual Greek word used. Now, this is another crippling effect of, of using what he's doing. So he, he'll go to the root word, and that makes it even worse when you go to the root word. So I, I, I'm, we'll, we'll, we'll see that as we go through these, uh, these quotations. So I want to read you some quotations from uh, reputable sources, and that you can and then hear how people describe these, these points I'm making. So here are some proofs to help dislodge traditional misconceptions that Strong's can be used as a dictionary. The exhaustive concordance, so number one, it's called concordance, not dictionary, of the Bible, generally known as the Strong's concordance, is a Bible concordance, an index of every English word in the King James Version of the Bible. Okay, so that means, index means, if you had, uh, let's say you had a sentence and you want to index a sentence, there's 10 different words. So now you take each of those 10 different words and put them in a column, each for each word separately. And so that becomes beginning of an index. Then you go to the next verse and then you look for, let's say it also has 10 words and only three are similar. So the three that are similar, you would put uh, underneath the same word that matches the first verse. And now that becomes two matching in a concordance that becomes two um, of the same verb or noun or whatever it is. And so that becomes an, an index starts growing. But you can see there's no dictionary definition, right? You're just simply taking the word. So let's say the Greek word is uh, pistis. And one time it's just, uh, translated as faithful and another time is faith. So now you have one word, but it's been used in two verses, two different ways. And so you have that as your examples. But if pistis meant grace, for example, you would never know. I'm not saying it does. I'm just using it hypothetically. So if there was an actual third meaning or fourth meaning, you don't know yet because they're not trying to give you a dictionary. It's a concordance. Okay. And then uh, the next one, Strong's. This is from uh, Strong's. is not a lexicon or dictionary from Bible her hermeneutics. Strong's Concordance is not a lexicon or dictionary, and thus is not a reliable source for the meaning of a lexeme in a specific context. So that's even talking about how to use what we would call roots of Greek words. So it's just, you cannot use it as a dictionary. You can use it only to find, frankly, verses that may be helpful or related in subject matter. But that's it. You can't tell somebody, well... <laughs> This word was used, you know, the same word was used over here and it means X and I'm going to use it over here. No, that's not how this works. So, and, and, and people have built whole uh, doctrines on saying, well, the Strong's Concordance says that it has these range of words and this is all I, I'm, I'm going to define it by. And now I'm going to now do a translation. So you can never, ever, ever, ever do a translation from Strong's. Do you see what I'm saying? You can find related verses using an index, a concordance, but you cannot use it to translate anything. Let's keep going. I have had such a problem explaining to some people that Strong is showing how the words are translated, but that doesn't mean that the words should or can be translated that way. And it's hard to conceive. Like, are you saying, Doug, that I can't translate it the way Strong's translated it? And the answer to that is yes, emphatically yes. You cannot do that reliably because Strong's is not a dictionary that you can take and say, this is the meaning of the word. You need to see the range of meanings of the word. And here's a very important fact, and this explains everything I'm saying, this one. And this is a, in an article entitled, The Problem Using Strong's Concordance 2016. Someone went to the trouble of writing a book, <laughs> and it's from Faith Bible Ministries. And here's what it says. James Strong's was not a linguist that understood biblical languages. So imagine you didn't know Swahili, but you want to get used to Swahili and you want to know how somebody who's who there 300 years ago translated the Swahili Bible into, um, excuse me, translated the Greek Bible into Swahili. But you know enough of Swahili, you want to start creating an index so you can kind of find related passages, but you're not trying to use this to translate anything. You would then try to find out, you know, if it said pistis, and translate it to Swahili as, you know, gulambado or some word like that. Then you write down gulambado. And then the next time pistis is translated, and but maybe it's some other word and it's, you know, uh, salome or something like that. So now you have two words that are for that. But, it, but you wouldn't tell somebody, well, the next time you see the word 
piss this, you should translate it by one of those two. You don't know enough. You, you need to know the whole range of meaning of that word. And yet this is not the purpose of a concordance. Okay. I hope I'm making the point repeatedly. <laughs> Though James Strong was a professor, he was not a professor in Greek or Hebrew. You see, so he had no linguistic training to do what you think you're using him for. You're taking him beyond his own capacity. He did not purport to have the capacity to know Greek, the meaning of any Greek word. You didn't need to know the meaning of Greek words in order to do what he did. That's maybe the best way of putting it. He was not fluent in these language languages. And I think they, the, I think he really means not fluent, but um, that he didn't read, he wasn't, uh, he could not read these languages in the original Greek. Most people don't speak classic Greek. Uh, he received but a summary introduction of education in these languages. Yeah. And his credentials as a doctorate of theology was only honorary. So, yeah, he, he was, it was a great contribution, a great step forward for many people to have even a concordance. We had nothing. And nobody created the dictionary that was useful. But wait till I show you the excellent opportunity you now have, which is really recent and really fantastic. And so there's no going back anymore to Strong's. So that's what I'm going to say. But let's get it ingrained. I want to make sure, because I keep saying this over and over to several people who send me comments, and I keep telling them, please stop using Strong's. It doesn't help you. And they and they religiously do it. I think they, you know, they, they've gotten so used to it, they don't know why they shouldn't do it. And I'm trying to make sure this, this erases any doubts. This great misunderstanding about what Strong's represents has created more false doctrine in churches because it does not give us the exact meaning of God's will concerning that word as seen in Greek or Hebrew word studies. So you see, there's actually a repercussion when you don't know that this, what you're doing is improper. In other words, you're taking Greek, uh, uh, Strong's concordance, and you're using it to try to give, teach doctrine. Oh, that's terrible. So you are misleading people. So you don't want to do that. So you have to stop doing this. This is, this is no longer even necessary to use it for a concordance. It's not necessary. You can just use electronic means, which automatically index and don't have this uh, problem. But finally, let's see here. Strong's is never meant to be preached from. It is meant to locate passages in the Bibles if you know only one word in that passage. And that's maybe the best way of putting it. Uh, thus, one can see that the KJV concordance approach being pushed today as the last word from 1611 suits a strategy to not appear dishonest when someone says Strong's omits pisto in Greek or John, uh, uh, the Greek of John 3.16 can mean obey or comply. So I tell people, John 3.16 doesn't say believe in. It definitely says obey unto in, in um, Greek. The NIV Theological Dictionary says when the verb pisto is used in conjunction with uh, an object of a person, it means to obey unto that person. And it's just clearly obvious from just reading classical Greek. <laughs> so it's indubitable. And if you go back and you study all the history from all the way in the early 1800s, 1600s, 1800s, 1900s, you'll see there's this evolving understanding of this. It took time for them. You know, it's a it's a big deal to change the word believe and to obey, isn't it? In John 3, 16, people don't want to do it, right? So the scholars, Vincent tried to change it, uh, Parkhurst tried to change it, but they had to use words that were getting close, like the word comply and, you know, turning over your life to Christ is what it means, you know, things like that. But, but it's now just simply, it's just the right word is obey. And so now it's going to take time, but this will eventually percolate because it's the truth. The Strong's editors lay out their concordance as a dictionary. And that's what fools you. Yeah. So you cannot say because it looks like a dictionary, it, it, it is a dictionary. It, so a lot of people use this, uh, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. But that's the problem with Strong's dictionary. It looks like a dictionary. It's laid out as a dictionary. And it uses definitions like a dictionary. It uses all the same appearances of a dictionary. But it's not a dictionary. And so that's where that whole rule about if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. No, it's not always true. It can fool you if your pastor or teacher does not tell you this is a misuse of Strong's. Your teacher makes you think it is a dictionary despite 400 plus years of scholarship improving on our knowledge of Greek. However, Strong's is not even a dictionary. Thus, the editors of such a concordance can continue to omit the word obeys or comply legitimately as the meaning of pisto in John 3.16. For example, however, there is no excuse any longer to think pisto means believe in John 3.16. See our link on John 3.16 here. Okay, so let me see here. 
the final conclusion. So people say, oh, then it's a misleading work. And well, no, it's not misleading. We are misled as what it is about. The very fact it calls itself a concordance is being honest that they're not a dictionary. And, but we don't, we don't realize the significance of the word concordance. So here's the conclusion. Strong's can be properly republished forever with no update and bestows true meaning because Strong's only claims to list the English word used in 1611 in the KJV to translate a Greek word. It is only the users and educators who cite Strong's as the sufficiently last word on a correct translation who err. And so you'll see some pastors don't know this. They, I mean, they were not properly trained in uh, theology school to know that Strong's is not a dictionary. And and maybe they didn't care about classical Greek. And maybe that, you know, they just brushed that aside and they thought, you know, concordance is a dictionary. So even educated people, even pastors can make this mistake. So if you've made that mistake as a lay person, don't feel bad. It's not that you're dumb. It's just it because it's, what is what did I say? It looks like a, it's laid out as a dictionary. It says it's using definitions, and that's really where it misleads people the most. It says, you know, the definitions that are used. Well, it's only in the concordance sense of definitions, not the ultimate de definitions. So it's laid out like a dictionary. It uses the term definitions like a dictionary. It's in the same alphabetical order as a dictionary. And it, so it just seems on its surface that it's totally proper to use, but it isn't. So don't use that anymore. So now I'm going to show you the alternative and the best and easiest means of looking up the meaning of words and seeing all the alternatives you can use to define what a word is. All right, so let's go over to BibleGateway.com. So this is, a, I'm sure if you go to Bible Hub, there's other ways to do this there, but I find this the easiest way to get into texts and look at their transliteral sense and look up their dictionary meanings. So, but you have to pick this one, Mountie Reverse Interlinear. And then what they do is they have the whole verse for this is how uh, for this is how God lo God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son, his only monogenes eos son, uh, that uh, th that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So they're resorting to what I would call the traditional translation. I think people would go up in arms if you change this, that I'm going to be serious. I think that's how people would do it. I won't even go to Mount C. He doesn't have his translated correctly, meaning he doesn't translate it the way you want it translated. But let's look there and we'll see what he does. So we go to the Pisto. And so we'll see here's the transliteral and you can, how to pronounce it. Pisto, I, how I do it. And you'd see your Strong's if you're familiar with that. And then um, I guess in this exact context, he's telling us it's in the pluperfect tense. I don't think so. Um, we'll have to look at it. Um, well, that's the blue pluper, perfect tense. I think it's in the uh, print participle, present part, participle active, but I could be wrong. Anyway, he doesn't. That's interesting. He's not going to break down to you how it's used in the sentence. So for that exact proof, you've got to go to BibleHub.com. So I'm just going to tell you that. I'm actually I've never noticed this before until today. But so. I don't think you can use him to tell you what the tenses are. Maybe I'll double check on that in a second. Uh, and then, so here's the different de uh, meanings. To believe, give credit to. To believe, have a mental persuasion. To believe, be of an opinion. To believe in or on. To believe, to be a believer. To entrust, commit to the charge or power or to be entrusted with. Now notice, you don't see once the definition of obey, right? Am I wrong though? No. And by the way, I mean, this is something I've researched up the yin yang, meaning I've looked at the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s. All these Bibles have this other meaning. I don't I can't tell you why they're not putting it in there. I suspect it's because it would be very unpopular that they ever think of changing it. But they must. One day they must. So uh, but I want you to see how they're doing it. And that's how you can use this. So you can actually, I mean, they didn't really give you much choices. The other alternative they gave you was entrust, commit to the charge or power of, whatever that might mean, in the passive, meaning where it's something is happening to something, uh, it's entrusted to somebody. That's how they're reading it. And that's in a couple of passages. So let's but I want to prove to you as well that this is not a complete, this is not the end of it. Your research may require you to go outside and 
get a theological dictionary to get an absolutely correct, uh, thorough thing. I can't explain why Mouncey doesn't have everything here. Okay, so you can see right here the NIV Theological Dictionary. It's from Zondervan, uh, the people who brought you the NIV. So you would think they would use their own dictionary to translate John 3.16, and you would think that Mouncey would know the meaning of this because it's really not a secret. Uh, but here is the actual uh, text where they explain this. Let me just make this a little bigger. And uh, it's very clearly right here. With the reference to people, pisto means to obey. The passive is, means to enjoy trust. So we saw that in in, uh, in Mouncey. But but we don't see this. With reference to people, pisto means to obey. So, and later, the NIV Theological Dictionary was amended uh, in 2014, 14 years later. And its new title was revised into the New International National Dictionary of New Testament Theology and Exegesis. And then it added this yellow highlight, which actually gave you the classic, a classic Greek text, which would have this meaning of pisto, meaning obey. So uh, it's referenced Sophocles, uh, uh, Oedipus Tyrannus 625, and it has the meaning of obey in that context. So just to give you an example, uh, I just want to show you a couple of other uh, texts that say the same thing. And so hold on just a minute here. Um, oh, so let's take a look at the Liddell Scott. I just want to show you something that may not be obvious at first. So this is Liddell Scott. If you went and looked up the dictionary, there's a, a online lexicon. So remember, a dictionary used to be called in the 1800s and earlier lexicons, sometimes dictionaries, but most of all, most often a lexicon, particularly if it was a foreign language for some reason. So you see the word comply. Well, what does the word comply mean? It means the same thing as I'm telling you. So let's take a look at that. Hold on. So if you wanted to look up the accuracy of the uh, translation of comply as obey, you could look over here in the Merriam-Webster in English. Comply means to conform, submit, or adapt uh, as required or requested. So that's pretty much the same thing as obey, right? Well, you can actually just go down here and you'll see the synonyms include follow, and there it is, obey. So that's a completely appropriate translation if from the Liddell Scott alone. Now, I want to show you that sometimes you have to make your journey very deep. And so I've shown you a little bit on the surface, the NIV Theological Dictionary, which that gave you something in the the year 2000 and the year 2014 to find the meaning. But sometimes you got to dig further back in the past to pull out something from there that you would otherwise lose. And I'm going to keep on this issue of the, the word pistoo to make my point. But this could be made about a lot of other words. So this is how far deep you may have to go back. So just to want to show you the other resources you can have. And you go to uh, books.google.com books and you can find every book for free that was written in public domain. And Vincent is a perfect example. He wrote a book called Word Studies. It was published in the early 1900s. This is Scribner's 1905. He discusses Pisto and Aeus, just as I've been saying, and he says it's more than mere acceptance of a statement. So it's not simply accepting that something's true sometimes. It is so to accept them practically. And he's talking about John 1, verse 12, by the way. So this is the Pisto Aeus unto Jesus which, what did the NIV theological say? It means obey. So you're going to see he's not saying the word obey, but he's saying everything but that. It's more than mere acceptance of a statement. So it's not a statement of facts. It is so to accept them practically. What does that mean? Hence, to believe on the Lord Jesus is not merely to believe the facts of his historic life or saving energy facts. So we all know Paul teaches that if you believe that Jesus died, buried, and rose from the dead, you shall be saved. Well, but that's not what Jesus says. In twenty, in, in actually, he points out, or uh, I think it's Grimm points out, it's thirty-four times. I actually was understating it as twenty-one or twenty-five times. Twenty, thir thirty-four times he says, "If you obey unto Jesus, if you bestow as unto Jesus, you shall have eternal life." So that's the repeated message, overemphasized, if you ask me, in the uh, Gospel of John. Paul only once in in. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 says, you can just believe three facts about the historical life of Jesus and you're saved. And these, and I believe the Gospel of John is, is, to, is specifically intended to refute that proposition by saying it 34 different times. So here is Marvin Vincent telling you, a very reputable uh, Protestant scholar, that you can't accept that meaning. When John's using it, definitely not. So he says here, uh, 
uh, hence to believe or pisto eis unto the Lord Jesus is not merely to believe the facts of his historical life or his saving energy as facts, but to accept him as your savior, your teacher, your sympathizer, your judge, to rest the soul upon him for present and future salvation and to do what else? To accept and adopt his precepts and example as binding on the life, okay? So that's 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 the big difference when you go to the lexicons. You're going to get a very much deeper meaning, and you're going to learn those things that you think are true are not always true. Another lexicon that's very important is Grimm's. And uh, now Grimm is uh, another resource that goes back, I think he's 1880s, or at least it was reprinted, translated, and done in the 1880s. At page 512 of his Grimm's lexicon, he's going to actually say when you look at Paul's conception of the word pisto, A-S, uh, it's predominantly about grace, okay? And so he's conceding. He, he can see that th this is the desire of Paul to make it all about, you just have to believe in some facts about Jesus and you're saved. So he says, uh, Paul Paul's conception of Pistow, Pistow uses this verb to be predominantly about grace by laying one's faith in Jesus, particularly in his death and resurrection. Okay, we, 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 we could repeat that over and over. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, no doubt it's there. No doubt it's there. But, He's saying in John's conception, which is actually Jesus's conception. He's a, this is a true apostle of Jesus Christ. Can we all agree? Apostle John is, is the apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul came later. He claims to have met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He may or may not have. Maybe this is even the proof that he didn't, because look at how much information after Paul Jesus gives John. So this gospel is written well after Paul, maybe to correct Jesus, Paul. Could, could, could that be a possibility? Since I'm giving you alternatives to Strong's, let me just finish it with the, the one that uh, you should add as almost every search or every topic you're researching. Go to BibleHub.com. For a variety of reasons, you can go to comments and you can look at all the leading commentaries all collected in one place. You can uh, uh, click uh, Lexicon. You get a, a dictionary definition of words that you, they're on the page. We're on Genesis 1.1, so it's going to use that. Uh, you can use an interlinear where you actually get the almost like Mousy, but uh, it's a different form. It's a different company. But you also can see the interlinear for the, the Hebrew, which is not available uh, on Bible Gateway this way. So this is important for Hebrew studies. Uh, it'll give you your Strong's numbers if you're still into that. And we're telling you to stop using that. Everybody, please stop using it. Uh, it has parallel, which is actually kind of interesting where you'll see the text um, in parallel, you know. So, but why do I recommend this? This is like, an, what is essential about this? So let's take a, uh, so by the way, I just want to show you how you research. So let's say you typed in John 3.16, right? And you type it in here in this little field, and then it's going to actually autofill. So you pick that and then you just jump there. That's the fastest way to get to things. Not, don't try to do it any other way. I found that it's too slow. So now you're here, and there's a lot of great things that you can do here, but the number one thing is you want to see the Greek tense to the words in this thing, for God so the world. Okay, so now we go to Greek, okay, and you want to see what's the what's the, the declension. So, like, you know, you could study Greek and, and even memorize these things, but you might not remember the exact uh, case and declension it's in. So having somebody having done it for you already is great. Okay, and then you go to, let's go to Pistoan. So this is uh, the transliteral into English lettering. This is the verb tenses over here, verb, P-P-A. And you'll see when you highlight it, I don't know if you'll show up in the screen, but it's present, participle, active. And then the NMS is nominative. You don't normally need to worry about that. Masculine, singular. And you could click it if you want, and it will give you, you know, the, the, the parsing abbreviations. And then you can use that to go to a uh, online website about uh, Greek verbs. So just type in Greek present participle active. You'll see the first thing that will come up will probably be a, a, a good neutral source. Just click on that. It'll now give you a definition of uh, the present participle active here. Grammar point two, present art active participles. And you're on your way. And you can start learning Greek. And um, that's... That's how to do it. And you can gr grow and, and you can be more sure of what you're studying is actually the word of God and you can understand it. It is a fact of life that we are we are trying to follow 
a, a Bible that is written in a different language. So learning something about that language can't be hurtful. And I think eventually you need to, some of your questions can only be resolved by your desire and, and, and spirit to find the answer by going into the Greek a little bit. And if it's a Hebrew text, then the same thing for Hebrew. All right. I hope this helps everybody. God bless. And uh, if you have any questions, just post them on the comments to this uh, YouTube. Okay. Ciao.